Okay, well, hi there. I'm Mark Wallace. Um, I'm here to talk tonight about why I don't accept modern evolutionary theory. So you might say, so what? Why do I care what Mark Wallace thinks about evolutionary theory? That's a good question. Um, I mean, the reason I feel this important to speak on this is um, that I think there are lots of people out there that would believe in God, except they've been convinced that God is not necessary um, by reason of evolution. That is, they've been convinced by you know documentaries or books, teachers or YouTube videos um, that the wonders of biology that we see all around us need no creator. That's what they've been convinced of. Um, you know, all the amazing variation of life we see and that we love, right? We all have our favorite things like, I don't know, dragonflies or whales or horses, um, you know, redwood trees, tropical fish, peacocks, all these things. They're, you know, they're just told these emerged by themselves over time. They're told this is a scientific fact. You know, the issue is totally settled, proven, beyond denial, and only that ignorant, unscientific people would say different. That's what a lot of people think. You know, but what if that's not true? I mean, wouldn't you want to know? If you, if you, and, and may, there may be people who, um, who believe that here. Um, I'll share in a second. I mean, I was an evolutionist. That's what I was taught. But like, if that's not the truth, don't people want to know? Don't we want to know the truth? I mean, no one really wants to believe a lie, right? Um, and in this case in particular, if evolution points at a creator, or I'm sorry, if the evidence instead points at a creator, shouldn't people know that, right? I mean, wouldn't that have some pretty important spiritual implications for people, right? To go, there's no way getting around, there was a creator, I better figure out what that means for me. OK, so let's get to it. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight is I'm going to explain what I mean when I say modern evolutionary theory. Um, I'm going to talk about the four top level requirements that uh, it needs for evolution, the four things that would have to happen for evolution to be true. Um, I'm going to talk about what scientific evidence do we have that these top-level things um, have occurred uh, or even can occur in sufficient quantity to be a viable explanation for the origin of life. Um, and really, my goal is to show that where this you know, science uh, really is lacking is in providing evidence that any of, this, um, any of the things needed for what I'm going to call molecules to man evolution even have occurred. Because um, if we can. If we can show that, like with science, that, or we can show that the science is really lacking, like maybe you've been taught, you know, it's a slam dunk, uh, everything's there. Uh, my intent is to show that the science is lacking. And so at one level, if we just show the science kind of isn't there, like you can't make that case for evolution, um, it would allow us to at least be kind of like agnostic, right? To use a, a religious term, right? Agnostic means I don't know for sure. Right? We could say, okay, the evolution doesn't work, and people could say, okay, well then maybe that's what happened, and maybe, maybe it didn't. Um, but if the science actually shows that it's extremely unlikely that these things even can occur in the quantity that their theory requires, then we kind of go not only from being agnostic about modern evolutionary theory, but we kind of go, we can be downright skeptical of it, right? If it doesn't pass the science test. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Um, and by the way, this has been my path. I was educated as a computer scientist. Um, I you know, use logic in my work every day. Um, I understand the scientific method. I understand that it's based on observation, right, and repeatable experiments. That's what science is. I'm an open-minded person. I hope we all are. You know, I, so I'll listen and follow the evidence. I was once an evolutionist just because that's what I'd always been taught, right? I mean. Growing up, I had books about dinosaurs, and they say 500 million years. I'm like, OK, I guess that's just the way things are. Um, until in 1999, um, someone, a friend of mine, a PhD actually, which is interesting, uh, challenged me with a scientific fact of, um, I'm going to get into my big words here now, a pure molecular chirality 
in biological systems. Uh, you can look that one up or I'll explain it later. Uh, chirality, C-H-I-R-A-L-I-T-Y. Um, uh, like I said, I won't get into it now, but biological systems have pure chirality. Um, it's something that if you think about chance and the odds of getting that, it kind of blew me away. And the point is, that started me on a journey of studying the evidence for myself uh, about creation versus evolution. It's become a passion of mine, and I love to share what I've been learning. So about 20 years of this now. Uh, lastly, the, you'll notice the talk is called, you'll notice it's called Why I Don't Believe in Modern Evolutionary Theory. You don't have to agree with me when this is all over. I'm just going to give you some food for thought on the subject and show you what at least changed my mind. OK, so let's dig in. So first off, what do I mean when I say modern evolutionary theory? Because people get kind of dodgy around the word evolution, especially when you want to start debating ideas with them. And, uh, and they'll say, well, evolution just means change over time, um, which essentially is something you can't possibly argue with. If, if they're going to say it's change over time, well, no one's doubting that things change over time, right? I mean, that's not something I'm doubting. You know, Darwin found that birds, you know, he found birds, some with bigger beaks and some with smaller beaks. Um, we know that dog breeding can create offspring with longer or shorter noses or legs or hair or whatever, right? So it's not like we don't believe that. That's not the kind of evolution that I'm skeptical of. We see that all the time. That's observable, right? We see that all the time. That is what science is about. Um, what I'm skeptical of is the kind that says you can go from non-living molecules to complex creatures like people, or horses, or whales, with no intelligence or know-how whatsoever being applied. That molecules to man evolution is what I'm skeptical of. Um, or as it um, says on the slide, spontaneous generation of life from non-life by undirected processes. Uh, no intelligent agent, no intention, just basically a recipe of chemistry plus time plus chance plus natural selection. Um, that's what the modern evolutionary theory now is trying to say, that you can get all of that. So I want to talk about, OK, let's, that, that's the evolution we're going to talk about, because I think that's people can play games and say other things. But that's what we're being taught. You can get all of this life from chance and time, right? Does that sound right to people? Is that what you think generally people are saying about evolution? So let's talk about uh, what would such, you know, if that's going to be true, what's it going to require? What would we have to see? What would we have to find proof of? Well, there's four top level things um, that it's going to need. Uh, and essentially, that the theory says happened, must have happened. Uh, first one, random assembly of the first living cell, right? We got to get a cell uh, without, ra randomly, without any intention. We've got to have long ages of time, because it's going to take a lot of time for all these changes to happen to get from an amoeba to, to Noah, for example. Amazing specimen of complexity. Um, you'd have to have many small successive mutations. This is really Darwin's theory. That's what he said. You're going to see, that's why you need a lot of time. You're going to just get slight small mutations, and they're all going to help it a little bit. So we'd have to see evidence of many successive small mutations. Uh, and lastly, um, the, these have to be beneficial mutations. They have to be in the DNA, because that's how things are passed on. And they have to increase complexity, um, because I think it's arguable that a person or a horse is more complex than, say, an amoeba, right? So it's not OK just that we see mutations. They have to be the kind of thing that can add information that make more complex structures as time goes on. So those are the four things evolution would have to have. So we're going to go through each of these, and we're going to talk about what's been actually scientifically documented and observed, right? Because science is about observation and repeatable experiments. So we're going to hit those four. Let's start with random assembly of a living cell. So that's, that's item number one. Has this ever been observed? Certainly not, right? I mean, a cell coming, uh, coming about um, on its own has definitely uh, never been observed. No one in the evolutionary world is claiming it has. Because um, that would pretty much be a slam dunk, wouldn't it? <laughs> like, hey, look, we're in the lab, and we made a cell out of nothing. I'd be like, oh, OK, I guess it can happen. Um, 
But no, that has definitely not been observed. Um, what's science about? Observation, repeatable experiment, one of the four things we need, never been observed. Okay, just think about that. Now, people might make excuses. Well, it takes a long time, et cetera. But you just got to at least be honest to say, okay, we're talking science, never been observed. All right, stick that in the back of our brains. Um, interestingly, even the non-random assembly of a living cell has not occurred. Now, by non-random, what do I mean? I mean, like, no scientist in any lab anywhere has ever been able to construct a cell from chemicals. It's just way too hard. They just can't do it. Even with all our current scientific know-how and technology, we can't do it. Now think about that one for a second. Even with all our know-how and all our technology, we still can't do it. It's supposed to have happened by accident. OK, interesting, interesting. Um, so given it hasn't been observed, what about the probability of it happening, right? Let's just talk about that. So it turns out that uh, some scientists have done analysis on the probability. Um, again, if you're taking notes, I might drop some names here. Um, there's a scientist named Hubert Yockey. That's Y-O-C-K-E-Y. -E I don't think I have it up here. Hubert Yockey calculated that the probability of a yeast cell Protein, okay, yeast, very, very small cells, very simple. They're one of the simplest ones to study. That's why there's a lot of research on yeast cells. Um, a single yeast cell protein made up of 100 amino acids, okay? So proteins are these things that pretty much make up all of the things in our body, right? And proteins are made up of amino acids. They're smaller molecules that kind of get put together, like Lego bricks. There's about 20 of those, and they make all kinds of proteins. Um, so take a yeast cell made up of 100 amino acids. That's actually a relatively small protein. Um, and uh, the probability that would form spontaneously as 1 in 10 to the 65th power. I don't know if you can see that up here. That's a 1 in a number with 65 zeros on it. So if you think of a million, it's got six zeros, and then a billion has nine zeros, and a trillion has 12 zeros. 65 of them. Okay. Um, he, uh, he did this computation uh, in, he has papers from 1978, 1981, 1992, uh, and it was confirmed by another scientist, a guy named Robert Sauer, S-A-U-E-R, uh, in 1989. So this, again, uh, calculated, and then that calculation was repeated by another scientist. Um, this, it's hard to get our minds around this. This is an event so improbable that it could be compared with winning the, the lottery, like right? it's going for the lotto, right? Winning the lotto every week in a row for 1,000 years. <laughs> 1,000 years. Possible in principle, I suppose, though if there's any Yahtzee players out there, I can't even roll a Yahtzee. I was playing with my wife. It took 13 rolls to get a Yahtzee. Um, but impossible in practice. Like, like truly, it's impossible in practice. People say, well, I mean, it could happen but that's never going to happen, right? And think about it this way. If someone won the lotto every week for 10 years, would you conclude that was random? You'd be like, what's that? You'd be like, uh, you'd be thinking something else is going on here. There's some sort of intention. There's some sort of non-random manipulation, but that's not going to happen. That'd be 10 years. This is 1,000 like clockwork, ding, ding. And none of us lived that long, but um, that's how far-fetched this is. Um, you know, if time were truly infinite, you'd have a lot of time to roll the dice, I guess, right? But time is not infinite. Uh, evolutionists don't think time is infinite, thanks to Einstein, right? Now they're like, okay, we only have a certain amount of time. Um, interestingly, if you take an evolutionist view that the universe is somewhere around um, 14 and a half billion years, um, that would only be, if you actually calculate the number of seconds, that would be a, a 1 with 17 zeros, okay? That's how many seconds since the start of the universe. So if nature was going to try out randomly building a protein, and it could do that 10 times a second, that would be 10 to the 18 tries in 10 to the 17 seconds. If it could do 100 tries per second, that would be 10 to the 19. But this is 10 to the 65th power. I mean, 
you realize every time we add one to the power, we get 10 times bigger. So now you're saying, okay, what about 20? What about 1,000 times a second? What about 10,000 times a second? What about a million times a second? You're not even close to getting near this number. Not even close. Do you see how improbable it is to get random creation of a protein in the time allotted by evolutionary theory? This is a protein. This is not the entire cell. We actually said we need to get a whole cell. Turns out there are 6,000 different kinds of amino acids just in the yeast genome. So you don't need one protein that you can't get in this many tries. You need 6,000 different ones all to work together to make a yeast cell. And this is a 100 amino acid chain. The average length in a yeast cell is 466. So all these numbers are way underinflated. That's how impossible it is to even get the proteins for a cell if you just have random chance working for you. Um, so um, that's just looking at the science and probability behind generating a protein in a living cell by chance. And that, essentially, that's the place where Darwinism can get started, because actually Darwin didn't write anything in Origin Species about life getting started. He said, assuming we got a single cell, what could we do with it? And he's like, I'm not even going to speculate how you get one. Though later in a letter, he wrote so to some of his colleagues. He said, well, maybe a warm pond and all this other stuff. But most of his theory is based on once you get a cell, what, where could you go? Um, so I don't know about you. Like, once I learn this, I'm kind of done. Like, I don't really need the other three. You're, you don't even need to show me the other three. But just in case, right, let's talk about, because what I want to show you is how impossible this is on many levels. So, OK. Getting the cell, where it almost could be done. But let's talk about the other four things that evolutionary theory says we got to have. So the next one is long ages of time. OK, so um, you know, actually, when we did this, and I kind of did some of the math, and I did 10 to the 17th seconds, we were looking at the probability of getting random generation of the first cell uh, in the time allotted for the whole universe. You know, but the Earth, evolutionists would say, is much younger than the whole universe. It wasn't there from the beginning. They tend to say the Earth is about uh, 4.5 billion years old. Um, and so how have evolutionists arrived at the age of the Earth? Well, when we dig into the Earth you know, at a large scale, like when people have been building, you know, for a few hundred years now, people have been building canals or digging tunnels, things like that. So I mean, they kind of observed, oh, wow, there's all these layers when we dig into the Earth. Not to mention things like the Grand Canyon, where you can see them. Um, and we call this the geologic column, basically just this, this list of layers, um, the geologic column. And originally, the column was just a description or a depiction of the different layers of rock. Like, hey, there's layers. Boop. Now we can talk about them. You know, This is this layer down here and up here. It was just, here's layers. Um, but that interpretation about a century and a half ago was changed um, by something called the modern uniformitarian theory. I'll explain what that is in a second. Um, but it basically says that rocks have formed slowly over millions of years. Um, and so basically, um, before that, people actually believed that the layers were probably of catastrophic origin. You know, uh, floods and things like that that put these layers down quickly. Um, but the uniformitarian process says that the Earth, the processes that alter the Earth, that kind of make it form, uh, are uniform through time. That's the uniformitarian part. Uniform through time. Um, they say that to get the layers that we see, you know, 4,000 feet thick in the Grand Canyon, for example, we'd see a deposit of about two tenths of a millimeter every year. That's about the width of a human hair. So they're saying that every year you'll get about a human hair's worth. Um, you know, and if you extrapolate that to that much thick stuff, you get a whole lot of time, right? So now they're saying, this isn't just a picture of layers. We're actually going to assign time to that and say, if it's this thick, it must mean the Earth is this old, not where they're originally coming from. Um, interestingly, the main proponent of this was a geologist named Charles Lyell. That's L-Y-E-L-L, -L. Uh, who actually um, greatly influenced Darwin. Um, he was one of Darwin's mentors. But how did Lyell, and, and he, he's, if you go back, I think it's like in 1828 or something, he wrote a very ancient influential book called Principles of Geology. And it was really the first time anyone was saying, hey, this is really old stuff. So how did Lyell come up with 
the age of the layers? Well, not a lot of people know this. He did so by estimating how long he thought that mollusk evolution would take. That is, he looked at shellfish in a certain layer, and he said, I wonder how long it would take them to evolve into the modern shells we see today. He said, well, that would probably take about 80 million years or so. And so he assigned that age to that layer, literally. So most of that's how they did it. So, and some people may think, oh, before Darwin, no one thought about evolution. People were already thinking about it. Darwin's book gave uh, a mechanism, which is survival of the fittest. He observed mutations. He didn't know how they worked. But he did see you know, survival of the fittest. And he said, well, maybe this is how things, if things can change, maybe this is how species got going. But, um, so that was his contribution, was a mechanism that might do it. But people are already starting to speculate that, you know, about, about evolution, and Lyell was one of them. Um, so then he thought, you know, given the thickness of that layer and the uniformitarian idea, he kind of extrapolated that to the other layers. He says, oh, cool. You know, at, at uh, a hair's width a year, we're at 4 billion years. That's it. <laughs> they, uh, you know, to make matters even more circular, um, I kind of have it here. What happens now is uh, the common practice to, is to date layers of the rocks by the kind of fossils we find in them. Yeah, it's really circular. So, um, and that's because not all rocks have radioactive elements in them. In fact, very few do. So since you can't date the rock, most rocks that way, they go, well, what kind of fossils are in them? And we already know these fossils are this old because of this whole mechanism. So now when we see another fossil like this, we're going to say the layer of rock must be this old. But the original guess of the date was by the kind of fossils that were in the layer, right? I mean, you see how circular it doesn't make any sense at all. They assigned ages to the rocks, assuming evolution had to happen, had to have time to happen. And then they say there's enough time for evolution because of how old the rocks are, right? It's crazy. It sounds crazy. Um, break from my script here for a second. Um, went to Smithsonian uh, a few years back with my family, and I thought, this almost just sounds too stupid to be true. This can't be right. Um, and I went and I found the display that had the geology on it. And it's like this big circular thing you can walk around. And literally, I read one side of it that says, you know, we date the fossils by what layer they're in. And then by the time I walked around, it says we date the layers by what fossils they're in. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Sure enough, uh, it's, it's crazy. You know, how is this scientific? Wait, it's not. Thank you. Yeah, uh, science is supposed to be testable, and theories have to be falsifiable, right? Uh, if, if you ever took a science class, you talk about hypothesis, right? You make a hypothesis, I, you know, I'm going to say things are this way, and then I'm going to do an experiment. And then if, I'm either going to say, yeah, my hypothesis worked, or I'm going to find it, it, it's broken, it didn't work, right? So in order to even be real science, uh, a theory has to be falsifiable. Um, you know, you have to be able to show that, that it's, uh, it has to at least, in theory, be able to be shown that it's false. How could the scientific, this scientific conclusion about the age of the layers be independently testable when one just fed the other? Now, you may say radiometric dating. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but that wasn't around when they did this. Um, and it turns out it doesn't work anyway, um, <laughs> which we'll get to in a sec. All right. So that's, uh, um, that's the first part of long ages of time. Let's, um, let's now, we're, we're scientists, right? Let's talk about what has been observed regarding geological layers, OK? Um, what has been observed? Well, uh, we were recently treated to a great laboratory for this um, called Mount St. Helens explosion. Anyone remember that? 1980, Mount St. Helens uh, exploded. Um, so great, now we can actually do some observational science. What did we observe with Mount St. Helens? We observed um, 100 feet of layers. It's about 100 feet of layers laid down in nine hours. Hmm, not a human hair width a year, but 100 feet in nine hours. And we saw that. 1980, right? We don't have to guess about these layers that we didn't see laid down. We saw these laid down. Um, by the way, those same layers were eroded in one day when uh, melted water, that was like, you know, the ice would melt in the cauldron, and then 
uh, the side of the cauldron would break out again, and that water would run down the hillside, and it basically carved that canyon. So we're supposed to believe something like the Grand Canyon takes millions or billions of years to get carved. We've seen 100 feet of rock carved in um, a day. It just makes you start to wonder, wait a minute, you know, if that's what we observe, why are we buying these conjectures about things we haven't observed, right? There's no way to test when you dig through a mountain and you didn't see the mountain get built. How old is this mountain? I don't know. But if you see layers get laid down and get chopped up, you start to say, hey, we actually observed this. We can do some science here. Um, you know, what does this say about dating the Earth by assuming uh, 0.2 millimeters a year? I mean, doesn't it just kind of make you go, well, why would I trust that estimate? I mean, I, I can see it's, it's not always that way. Maybe, maybe somewhere it's that way, but it's not always that way. Um, and maybe it's not that way. Where are we actually seeing that kind of depositing? Um, it's certainly true that at a human hair's width a year, you could never make a fossil, by the way. Fossils have to get completely buried so that no oxygen can get to them, right? Because, I mean, what happens to all the other things that die? They just kind of... They rot away, scavengers take them, right? So to get fossils, you actually have to bury things rapidly. So this whole hair width per year doesn't make sense in that anyway, but we'll let that go. Um, we've also observed some other things uh, in, in the layers. In the American Southwest, like the Grand Canyon, where there's like a mile thick of layers, um, and all the layers are really clean lines. Uh, they seem to lack signs of erosion, right? Like water channeling between those layers, um, water erosion, roots growing down into them, burrows from animals. We don't see any of that. It's just rock, 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 you know, thousands of feet of rock, clean layers, very little erosion. Now, if, they, if it was taking that long, to, wouldn't you get rain runoff? Wouldn't you get plants growing in roots? Wouldn't you get animals burrowing and digging it up? We don't see that. It sure looks like those were laid down pretty quick and didn't have time to get messed up. Um, what about bent layers of rock? I don't know if you can see this from where you're at. This is out in the American Southwest. Do you see those? Okay. Could you lay th those layers down at 0.2 millimeters a year? And then when they got that thick, bend them around without them breaking? I mean, also I'm, I'm just talking observational science, right? Just, we see this stuff all the time. Um, doesn't it kind of appear that you would have to bend all that at the same time? Maybe while it was still wet to get those kind of shapes? What about this one? I love this. Um, this is called a polystrate fossil. Has anyone ever heard of a polystrate fossil? Yes. One person. I had never heard of this. Well, my wife has. Um, uh, this is basically, it basically means a fossil um, that goes through lots of layers, that poly straight, lots of layers. So um, basically, this is a fossil tree going through about 15 feet of layers. Now, how did that happen? If thick layers take millions of years to form, how did they form around that tree? Did the tree stand there for millions of years while the layers kind of slowly built around it? Wouldn't the tree kind of rot away? Or did the tree and the layers have to be deposited very quickly? I mean, I don't know what you think. Uh, you know, if there's a, think of Mount St. Helens. You take a bunch of trees down, they're tumbling. All this uh, volcanic ash is coming down with it. They tumble, tumble, tumble. It all goes, <laughs> comes to a stop. Trees straight up and down, right? Lack of oxygen, right? It's going to fossilize but it would have all had to happen like at the same time, not millions of years by any stretch. So I mean, if you end up with, okay, so now we got you know, 4,000 feet of layers, but we see layers can be laid down really long. It makes you start to question that the geologic column is really a uniform timeline, right? It's just like big chunks of that could happen instantaneously. We kind of have no idea now by looking at the layers how old things really are, right? Uh, these are actual observations. Uh, AKA science, that seem to refute the ideas that layers form slowly. Okay, now some will say, well, regardless of evidences like that of the layers being laid down quickly, we do know the rocks are really old because of 
radiometric dating. You might have heard of radiometric dating. The idea of radiometric dating is that the radioactive decay occurs and certain atoms, like the yellow ones, break down into a different kind of atom over time, uh, you know, like a half-life of atoms. And, um, you know, through other experiments, we know what the half-lives are. And so if we measure the current ratio of the parent to the child, like, you know, we get down here, we're like, okay, what's the ratio now of things all used to be uranium and now they're mostly lead, you know, uh, we know how long it takes, let's, let's back that up like a clock. Um, that's the theory. Um, it does assume a constant rate of radioactive decay, right? Half lives, like we've said. Um, and it does assume what the initial amounts are. Uh, science bonus question for you. How could you ever confirm our assumption of the initial amounts? Right? If you're going to take a rock now and go, well, I can back it up and assume there was no lead in there, and run a calculation. How could, this is science, how could I know it started that way? What if there's already lead in there? Imagine you got a bucket of balls, uh, you know, like, um, you know, yellow and blue, and I say every minute, I, I want to move a ball from here to here, and you look in this bucket, and there's five of them. I say, how long did it take? I say five minutes. I said, no, I started with the bucket, had four in it. Right? How do, you, how do you know how it started and how it ended? Uh, there's no really way to test that. Um, anyway, with this approach, and it's got these assumptions in it, um, you know, people have dated rocks and they say they're billions of years old. Okay? And that's what we're told. You just got to believe it. We have these radiometric things to do. Uh, so how could you test that method? Let's be scientists. We're on a testable method. What if you took a rock of known age and then tried this and see if you got the same age? That would seem like a pretty good experiment, right? Right? I know this rock is this old. Give it to a lab. Let's see what they say. Turns out this actually happened. Um, a group of scientists took a rock sample from a part of the Hawaiian lava flow that was known to have been laid down in 1801. People lived in Hawaii by 1801. They know when it went down, right? There was villages there. They sent it off to a lab. They didn't tell the lab where it came from. Lab potassium argon dated the sample and concluded it was somewhere between 160 million and 3 billion years old. Whoops. It's less than 200 years old, right? I call that a spectacular failure. That's not just a failure. That is a spectacular failure in dating. Um, not to mention, do you notice the range of values they did provide? 160 million to 3 billion. That's like, so how high is that building? That's 160 feet. Oh, wait, no, it's 3,000 feet. You're like, what? Like, these numbers aren't even close to each other. Um, you know, they're okay with that. They're actually willing to publish that. Ah, somewhere between 160 and 3 billion, but at least it's old. Uh, turns out, <laughs> right? Turns out it's not old uh, because we know it. And then if you think about it, that's the only way to test that. Any other thing where you say, you know, let's say they didn't have this, and they say it's 160 million years old. How would you know? How do you know how old something is that you didn't see get formed? But here's something we did see get formed, and, and they gave it this date. I like, spectacularly wrong. Um, here's another one. There's a lava flow in New Zealand contained a piece of embedded wood. So again, you got lava flowing. It's picking up trees as it goes, right? Uh, the wood was carbon dated. That's still a radiometric method, so I'm not even saying that's accurate. But the same thing, the wood in it was dated at less than 1,000 years old by carbon dating. The flow it was embedded in was dated at 465,000 years old. How is the wood that the lava flow captured and carried younger than the lava that captured and carried it? I mean, those are so far off. It just, it's, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. You know, one of those dates, at least, is clearly wrong. The methodology just seems to be flawed, if that's the kind of answers you can get. Um, I mean, and, and once these things are brought out, like once that Hawaiian thing was brought out, if you go look this up, then you'll see all these excuses and explanations as to why we got this anomalous result. Oh, well, it's because there's, you know, uh, too much of this kind of stuff in the rock or whatever. But if you think about it, um, we only caught this because it's, it's, it's uh, something of known age. If someone gets a date, like I guess what I'm saying is, 
you give them the date, yeah, this is only 200 years old, and go, oh, well, here's why we got it wrong. But if you never had that to show them it was wrong, they just assume it's right. Like, how would you ever test that it wasn't right? You can't. We only have, we, the best we can do is say, well, here's a few cases when we have it young, and look what happens. Um, anyway, to wrap up uh, you know, long ages of time, we, we've kind of seen that the layers are said to show long ages of time because it takes millions of years to lay them down. Um, but we've seen that layers can be laid down very quickly, right, as evidenced by Mount St. Helen, uh, the bent rock layers, the polystrate fossils, right? These are scientific observations. I mean, we, we're looking at them. We're doing a hypothesis. We're doing a test. We're seeing if the, if the hypothesis passed or not. We've also seen spectacular radiometric dating failures, right, for rocks that we actually can know the age. Um, and I think we have to acknowledge that uh, any old dates for rocks that we have no independent way of testing, like no other way to say that rock is old, you know, we have to admit that there's no independent way of testing it. That's not really science. Bottom line is long ages of time on the Earth are very hard to scientifically establish. Current approaches are based on assumptions like uniformitarianism, and they're not reliably testable. Um, furthermore, I won't go into this a lot, uh, every other geochronometer, another big word, but it just means geo means Earth, chronometer means like time. Like, if you look at any other way that you might scientifically try to back up to times, like the amount of salt in the ocean, right? If it was supposed to be fresh water and then things started to erode and put salt in it, what's the oldest it could be? Um, the amount of silt in river deltas, right? Rivers are constantly putting stuff out. Um, uh, there's actually something called radio halos in rocks. Uh, when rocks uh, have helium when they're, when they're formed and the helium is a small little molecule, it can just work its way out. You can measure how much helium is left in the rock. Every other geochronometer gives much, much younger ages of the Earth. Only radiometric dating gives anything in these billions of years, and that's why evolutionists tend to only point at that one. But there's a lot of other ones that don't work. Um, that, that would imply different. As we've seen, this one's not trustable. Uh, next up, many small successive mutations. OK. Um, this is Darwin himself. Basically, uh, modern evolutionary theory, for the most part, says there's many small successive mutations in living systems, no big leaps. Um, it's part of Darwin's theory. Um, Darwin expected enormous numbers of mutations, right? He's, this is a quote from Darwin's actual book, Origin of Species. I'm not, you know, putting bad words in his mouth. He said, the number of intermediate varieties, meaning like things slowly changing over time, uh, which have formerly existed on the Earth must be truly enormous. He's like, there's got to be tons of these for my theory to be correct. What did Darwin observe? Darwin himself observed. Why then is not every geological formation, every stratum, full of such intermediate links? Listen to what he says. Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this, perhaps, is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be argued against my theory. He just admitted it, mostly. The explanation lies, as I believe, in the extreme imperfection of the geologic record. So Darwin basically says, we should expect an enormous number of small successive changes. Hypothesis, good. We don't actually observe them. There, good for him. Therefore, must be a bad geological record. Mm. <laughs> I feel like you know, <laughs> he's admitting that science observation is not confirming his theory. Then he gives an excuse as to why science doesn't confirm his theory. I think to be fair, it should be more like hypothesis. There should be many transitional forms. We should see this in the fossil record. Experiment, let's go look at the fossils. Observation, we don't see them. Conclusion, our hypothesis is disproved. Maybe things don't evolve by many small successive changes. That would seem like science to me. Um, uh, and as Darwin admits, there are very few fossils that could be argued as being a transitional form. So let's talk about that for a second, because people have probably heard about this. Um, let's talk about what things, what few things, have been put forward by evolutionists as a transitional form. Probably the most famous, Archaeopteryx. Anyone ever heard of Archaeopteryx? Yeah, see at least some nods. It's probably the most famous one. Um, again, we should expect to see an enormous number of them. We only uh, see this one, but um, it's said to be a transition between a reptile and a bird, right? 
Um, it's got wings and feathers, plus it has teeth and claws. It's got teeth in its beak and it's got little claws uh, on its wings, about halfway down. Pretty cool, huh? I mean, that sounds pretty good. That one's like, okay, maybe that's, maybe we got something here. If you hear all those theories about dinosaurs coming from birds, um, sorry, the other way around, birds coming from dinosaurs, that's why you hear that. Two problems with this theory. Uh, one is, there are modern looking birds, meaning birds with feathers and beaks with no claws uh, and no teeth, lower in the geologic column than the Archaeopteryx, right? So he's supposed to be the transitional form, but assuming you're going down the layers, you're getting to older stuff, you already got regular birds down there, right? It's hard to be your grandparents' parent. That's, the, you know, that's what's going on with that one. The other one is, turns out birds with claws exist today in Venezuela. So having claws isn't some weird thing that happened on the way to getting birds. We still have birds like that. We got regular birds and we got birds with claws. So this is not a slam dunk on the way from one to the other. Regular birds are older and we still have them. They're just two different varieties of birds. Okay, so let's talk about Darwin. Uh, if you've heard of Darwin's The Beaks of the Finches, and when people talk about Darwin's finches a lot. What did Darwin observe, right? Back to science. What did he observe? Uh, 14 types of finches with different beaks. Okay? Cactus finch, large cactus finch, large ground finch, etc. cetera. Um, you know, he documented these uh, birds. Um, fine. I have no problem that species have variation. No problem with that. I say that every day. People can be born with all kinds of heights and eye colors and nose sizes. Birds can have variation too. Uh, I have no problem with those variations maybe giving a slight survival advantage in some environments, right? I mean, that's what he observed, okay? But observing, you know, we're talking about what's been observed versus what hasn't. We're just trying to figure out where is the science. The science is, hey, we see this kind of thing. Um, observing these small variations is not in any way proof that we can go from a single cell to birds or to dogs or to people. That leap jumps way beyond what he observed, right? There is something he observed, but then he said something happened that he didn't observe, which is that we can get this full evolution. Um, that's the thing about birds. What did he uh, observe about other things? Or actually, I like to call this, what did uh, Darwin not observe? Um, it's just right here, uh, OOS is origin of the species. Um, he has a famous explanation of the eye, the human eye, or just eyes in nature. Uh, in uh, chapter six of Origin of Species, he tells the story of how a complex eye could evolve. Uh, and I'm just gonna, you can go look it up. He says, uh, if we must compare the eye to an optical instrument, we ought to, uh, we ought in imagination to take a thick layer of transparent tissue, thick layer of transparent tissue with a, Nerve sensitive to light underneath, and then suppose that every part of this layer, this layer of transparent tissue, to be continually changing slowly in density so as to separate into layers of different densities and thicknesses placed at different distances from each other and with the surfaces of each layer slowly changing form. And he goes on, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the bottom line is he imagines a story about he thinks an eye could form. And then he's done. Is a story science? I mean, seriously, the, and, and what's funny is he says this, and then he says, hey, and if evolution can explain the eye, it can explain anything. Like, yeah, but you didn't explain the eye. You know, you just told a story. Could have happened this way. Imagine this. He actually, the word he used, we ought in imagination to take a thick layer of blah, 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 blah. Okay, but is a story science? Is it observation and experiment? No. I mean, how does he get away with this, really? It's not an observation, it's not science. It's a story. It uh, runs ahead of any experimental validation. There is none. Um, okay, finally, number four of four. All right, I said there was four things we need to do. The last one is beneficial mutations that increase complexity. Beneficial mutations that increase complexity. Okay, Darwin didn't know how the small mutations occurred, right? He was not aware of the work of Mendel on genes, if you remember from class, biology class, talk about Mendel. He didn't know about that work that was kind of happening in parallel a different part of the world. He did know that mutations or changes in organisms can be inherited because of things like dog breeding, sheep breeding, right? I mean, he knows 
you can put these two smaller dogs together, get even smaller ones. So he knew um, things could inherit traits. He just didn't know what the mechanism was. So the modern evolutionary theory goes beyond Darwin and it brings in uh, genetics and DNA, right? And, uh, which are things Darwin didn't know about. The modern theory says that only changes in the DNA can be passed to a child, right? Like if I get my finger cut off, my kid's not gonna be born without a finger. That's not in the DNA, right? I gotta have it in the DNA. So, uh, beneficial mutations. Remember at the beginning we said you've gotta go up in complexity. It would require uh, random changes in DNA, only in the DNA, right? Changes that make their way into offspring, changes that change a physical characteristic, uh, and that physical because it has to interact with the environment selecting on it. And that it improves the fitness for survival. That's basically what a beneficial mutation would, would have to be and, and do. Um, so if the modern evolutionary theory is going to get us from amoebas to like humans, <laughs> that's going to require many, many, many mutations, right? These mutations must increase DNA information. They have to... Uh, add enough information to build new biological structures that weren't there before. I mean, eventually building eyes, arms, teeth, digestive tracts, skin, hearts, blood, blood vessels, right? All that has to come, that, that's way more complex than an amoeba. So that has to somehow get generated. Um, back to my science question, right? Getting boring now. <laughs> what has been observed? What have we actually seen? Um, how's this quote? I don't know if I have this on the slide. Yeah. No one has ever observed a spontaneous inheritable genetic mutation that resulted in a changed physical characteristic, aside that is from a small group of well-known and usually fatal genetic defects. Richard Milton, Shattering the Mists of Darwinism, 1997, page 157. Okay. Now, even if you want to take objection with Mr. Milton, because you can point it some study or some little bit of literature that can argue for one or two little actual cases of this. He's saying there's none, but some people say, oh, well, you can argue that this is actually a beneficial mutation. See, slam dunk, we had one. Okay. Um, it doesn't really bother me because you'd have to show that this is likely to happen in such numbers that you can get from an amoeba to a human or a horse or a whale. You'd need a ton of them. He's saying, no, no one has ever observed it. If someone observes it, you're going to hear about it. But it's not going to be, I mean, you're not hearing about it. Um, you need a ton of these, right? Um, here's another little dodge people do. Some people will point at sickle cell anemia as an observed mutation that creates malaria resistance. Okay, Sickle cell anemia, uh, anemia is when your red blood cells stop being a little donut and kind of turn into a banana. Um, Malaria can't attack it anymore because of the shape is different. Like, see, we've observed that. Science, right, Mark? Like, okay. Um, but that's a loss in genetic information that caused the sickle cell media. Some mutation happened that made it like worse. Like it, it lost the ability to build the donut and it kind of crumpled on itself. So, yeah, okay, um, you showed that something can mutate and create, I mean, I wouldn't argue, like, I don't want to have sickle cell anemia to not get malaria. I'd rather take a malaria pill. But, um, but the point is they're saying, see, it would increase the fitness by a change. But showing a mutation that loses information does nothing to convince me that mutations can add information, right, and get more complex structure. And the other thing they'll point to is, like, there's fish in the deep ocean with no eyes. See, proof of evolution. That creature has changed, it doesn't grow eyes anymore. What am I gonna say? I mean, it's pretty obvious now based on what I just said about sickle cell anemia, right? That's a loss of information, right? The genome that used to know how to make an eye can't make an eye anymore. That does nothing to prove to me that you can go from a genome that doesn't know how to make an eye and make an eye. That's the trick. That's what they have to show. And they have to show that over and over and over and over again to get um, to, get to people and the other complex creatures we see. Um, so I, I'm not buying that. Um, I, I'm, I'm with Milton. Uh, all the arguments I've seen for beneficial mutations um, don't add information, and they certainly aren't enough of them to ever get from you know, amoebas to man. It's just, just not happening. The science is not there, and that's my point. Um, cool. 
Evelyn's mostly awake. That's great. Uh, it's time to wrap up. I think we did it. I think we uh, identified the four big things that modern evolutionary theory uh, needs to account for to explain the origin of all the amazing uh, variation of life we see on this planet. Uh, we went through them uh, one by one. And um, we see that the scientific evidence, um, to see what the scientific evidence is that these things did happen, right? for evolution to be true, they would have had to have happened, or even that these things could happen. Um, and here's where we landed. Is there good evidence for evolution? Random assembly of the first living cell? Extremely improbable. Long ages of time on the Earth? No way to confirm, right? Layers aren't doing it. Radiometric dating seems pretty flawed. That's all we got. Many small successive mutations not found in the fossil record. That's why they call it the Cambrian explosion. If you've ever heard of that term, they're like, suddenly there's all this stuff, and they can't see how it got there. Just life, just boom. Small successive mutations not found in the fossil record. Beneficial DNA mutations that increase complexity. Nice round number, zero observed, right? So is there good evidence for evolution? I don't think so. I'm saying from science, you, you prove me this is how it worked, I'll buy it. I'm not seeing it. That's the agnosticism, right? Agnostic against evolution. Let's go further. Is there good evidence against evolution, right? It's not just we don't know. It's like I don't think this could have done it at all. Um, extreme unlikelihood of random assembly of the living cell. We talked about that. And uh, actually, the absence of uh, observed beneficial uh, mutations at any level that we would need to get where we are now. So basically, those are the scientific and logical reasons why I do not accept modern evolutionary theory. Um, and so I just want to circle back and just point out that this entire talk is really just to give you, in a way, not that I'm the guy who can give you permission, but it kind of is if you felt like, it's like giving you permission to use science and common sense to question what you've been taught about evolution. All we did was use science and common sense. Um, I mean, if it's okay to be a skeptic about religion, right? It's okay to be a skeptic about evolution, right? It's just as fair. It just means we're not going to accept something without being given some good reasons to believe it. That's all it means. I believe in the science. science. I believe in the scientific method to gain knowledge about certain kinds of things. I was raised an evolutionist, mainly because that's just what Evelyn said. I assumed it was true. But I'm also open-minded. I'll hear out other people's positions, and I'll listen to their evidence. I hope you do, too. And now that I've been open-minded and studied the evidence, I think the science actually refutes the modern theory of evolution. Thanks for paying attention. <laughs> <laughs>